Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. This is a program where we are very vitally interested in the Bible. The Bible is the only book that God has personally written and given to us. You know, I was thinking today, mankind goes along, we or try to earn a living, we seek pleasure, we try to do our thing, we try to develop our own uh, estate, our own wherewithal, whatever, and uh, really we think it's me uh, over against the world, or me over against all the other people, me against the circumstances, and uh, I just have to have, be wise in what I do, I have to and and certainly the brakes have to fall my way to some degree and then everything is going to be fine and basically as mankind goes along they have no conscious thinking at all that overriding everything there is almighty god that god is present in every aspect of this world's activity, he's intimately acquainted with every aspect of it. He finally guides uh, the affairs of men so that uh, they'll move in a direction that God wants that uh, direction to be. And of course, we don't see God, we don't feel his hand, we don't to know, we don't have any, any sense that God is doing this. But the fact is, uh, we are not alone. God is everywhere present. And God is intimately involved in the affairs of every human being. Uh, because God is, uh, is concerned about mankind and about this earth. And he has a certain plan that has to be developed, that has to be brought to a finality. And uh, only as we read the Bible can we begin to get a little sense of this. Can we really understand that God is God and that, uh, that what man is doing uh, may seem ultra important. Uh, it may seem like it is going to be this or work out that way, but only God knows how he wants it all to work out and lots of times he lets mankind just go on their way to disaster most of the time it goes that way and mankind is heading for disaster because uh, he is rebelling against the laws of God he is saying I know better I will I will work out this uh, my way here on this earth and uh, somehow it's all going to come out fine, thank you. Uh, but they fail to realize that, no, it's not going to come out fine, because finally there still is a day of reckoning when each human has to stand before God and answer for the way he lived out his life. And unless the Lord Jesus has become our Savior to pay for our sins, we are in deep and terrible trouble. And more than that, God is the one who sets all the timelines. We can lay out plans that in the next year we're going to do this, or the next 10 years we're going to do that, or our goal is before we die that we'll have achieved this or that. But really, really, uh, God is the one who sets the timeline, and there is an overall timeline for history, the very history of the world. And, uh, and this is what the Bible talks about. And when we search the Bible carefully, we are awed, we are astonished, we are dismayed to find that in all likelihood we're only a very few years from the very end. Oh, my, for 13,000 years, people have been wondering how long will this earth exist? And from time to time, individuals have felt 
things had <clears throat> become so bad in their environment or in the world as they understood it that they felt we must be near the end of something and, in, and again and again they have been incorrect because then the world has gone on for another hundred years or another thousand years but today everything is beginning to fit into place that we're very very near the end of time and so if there's ever a time that it's imperative absolutely imperative that every human uh, begins to read the Bible every human being begins to hear what the Bible has to say this is the time and of course, of course the consequence of this is that as people begin to read the Bible and listen more carefully there are the, amongst them those who will become saved because the biblical rule is faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God and the word of God is the Bible so there is a great hope for those who will begin to think seriously well what does God have to say who is this God what can we know about him what does he say about time and these are the kind of things incidentally that we talk about on this program because all of that is written about in the Bible and this program is dedicated to trying to understand the more the Bible more accurately and more completely but this is your program we do want to hear from you <clears throat> so shall we take our first call tonight please good evening welcome to open forum hey mr cammy how you doing this evening very well thank you uh, i have uh two questions for you uh, the first one is um first kings chapter 16 verses 11 first kings chapter 16 verse 11 there we read there we read uh, and it came to pass when he began to reign this is Asa who was the king over Judah that he slew all the house of Baal he left not one that that urinates against the wall neither of his kinsfolk nor of his friends now what is your question well, I've I've seen that in a few other places in the Bible where it's talking about pisses against the wall. What is that? Um, what is, what's God talking about well, there? Well, it's a figure of speech to indicate men. Uh, men urinate against the wall. Uh, in our King James Bible, we read the word pisses, which is an old English word. We don't. Uh, we nowadays we would probably use the word urinate, uh, but it is speaking about those who. Uh, who are men now why God used that particular uh, phrase that I don't know I've never really studied that carefully in the Bible uh, although you are correct that it is found in a number of places thank I mean, you is it, some, is it something they just uh, I guess did back then I guess or? well no excuse me it was the fact that uh, that uh, God wrote the Bible he wrote these words God chose these words very very carefully uh, but it certainly is one uh, uh, unique way to describe to differentiate between a man and a woman and uh, so here definitely and sometimes you know when the Bible uses the word men we can't tell from the context whether he's using that in the general sense of mankind which would include men and women uh, but when he uses the phrase those who urinate against the wall there's no question he's talking about males he's not talking about females at all but thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum hello yes good evening welcome to open forum uh, mr captain yes um what you said at the beginning of the program is just very real and i'm wondering if you can uh, go on in addition to what you said at the beginning of the program in terms of why you believe it's near the end of time again 
and well, if the signs are falling in place. Well, yeah, you see, the uh, uh, the uh, Bible indicates to us that uh, those who are true believers will not only begin to understand the law of God more and more clearly, and and the Bible is the law of God. It is a whole series of commandments, of rules, of regulations, of of uh, uh, precepts that God has laid down as to how we are to live and how God is to uh, act with us and we are to act with God because God also is under the law of God but also it is a book that has an enormous amount of time information now God has not emphasized that in the lives of the theologians and the Bible teachers of the past that is something that is really been reserved for our time uh, because it's only in our generation that we finally have been able to find the calendar uh, in the Bible of history, the calendar that shows that history began in the year 11,013 B.C. when we tie the biblical information into our modern calendar. And uh, then uh, we also have been able to find a, an, in, an enormous amount of detail of how, uh, uh, when this happened, when that happened, when the other, next thing happened. And when we lay it all out, we find that, that as God unfolded his salvation plan throughout the past 13,000 years, it was not done by, by uh, in a haphazard way or in some kind of an erratic way where uh, it seemed like, well, after a while, God said, well, now let's see. I think I better try something else for a while. We find that everything, uh, th there is a harmony. There is a, uh, ev everything uh, 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 has a, pa there's a pattern to the way things develop. And as a matter of fact, God has even given us illustrations in the Bible, patterns of historical events that mimic the pattern of the very end so that that helps us to even more clearly uh, put into place the detailed timeline of the end and it's God's intention that we're to know these matters of time so that when Christ comes again while for those who have not been interested in trying to find any time information in the Bible which consists of which would include most people in the churches and congregations. Uh, they uh, have never been taught this at all, and they, so they are simply ta teaching, uh, well, Christ will come as a thief in the night. We can't really know when he will come. They're, that's because they're not up to date on what the Bible is teaching. But on the other hand, and also in the world, for those who are uh, not interested in the Bible at all, who don't trust the Bible at all, uh, for them too, uh, they will take their chances. Oh, yes, maybe there's going to be an end someday, but you know the world's been around for a few hundred million years, and maybe it'll go on for another million years, and so on. But for the true believers who are listening very carefully to the Bible and searching out the Bible, as we uh, develop this time information and lay it all out, we begin to see uh, how it uh, how it uh, focuses on, and uh, it appears to focus very strongly on the year 2011 as being the final year of the Earth's existence. So at that time, Christ uh, should come as the as the judge of all the Earth and and this universe will have completed its work and and uh, will come to an end and uh, uh, so far from everything we can read in the Bible it, it, that appears to be where we are coming to although true believers uh, because we want to be as faithful as possible and as accurate as possible never cease to uh, check and double check and triple check uh, any information they've had in that we've had in the past or up to the present uh, to make sure that we have uh, have uh, put it together correctly and to make sure that we haven't missed something and uh, and we constantly 
are searching the Bible in case there may be still something that we have missed. But so far, everything appears to be falling on the year 2011 as the final end of time. And that's, that's, uh, that's uh, awesome beyond measure because my, that's five years away. And, uh, and if, if, uh, if we can just imagine that uh, it, it's such a high likelihood that in five years all the plans of men will come to an end and every human being who has not become saved will be taking their turn to stand for judgment uh, to, uh, before the throne of God himself as the judge. And unfortunately, everyone who's standing there will be found guilty, and we already know what the penalty will be that will be assessed. It's an enormously dreadful penalty, eternal damnation, to be damned in hell forevermore. So it is a critical, uh, a critical question, a critical question. Unfortunately, most people stick their head in the sand like the proverbial ostrich. They don't want to hear about it. It's too ugly to think about. They know. Every human being knows deep in his heart someday he's got to answer to God. Sometime there will be uh, that time because God has created man in the image of God so that intuitively, whether he denies it up and down and, and uh, uh, tries to prove... Uh, uh, through any kind of uh, stratagems that there is no God, deep in his heart he knows there is a God that he has to answer to. And, and he knows that he'll be found guilty. And because all of that is so unacceptable, mankind either uh, just is in total denial uh, that this could be, or they uh, are trying desperately to find a religion that they can live with that uh, will bail them out in a way that is pleasing to them without doing it God's way and so on. And, uh, but it doesn't change anything. Our time is moving along right to the end. And when the end comes, it will be here. There will be no more mercy, no more salvation. It will be the end. But thank you. And, of course, in the meanwhile, and this is the glorious side of it, uh, the more I read the Bible, the more I find that God is making abundant references to the fact that in our day, and, uh, and we don't know how this is going on, we know, uh, but in our day there's a great multitude which no man can number that are being saved as we send out the true gospel and faithfully declare uh, what the law of God is concerning all of this and, and indicating that mankind does have a hope as they, as they uh, uh, plead with God for mercy that there is a hope for salvation. We do know that there will be an abundant harvest of true believers coming in, but God has to do all the work. We won't even know who they are. Or we may hear of one now and then, who uh, suddenly has developed an intense interest in the Word of God, and he's maybe begun to listen to a program of family radio where he's being taught uh, something about uh, uh, how, to, how to approach the Bible and recognize that the Bible is the Word of God and so on, and, and uh, it is to be absolutely trusted and so forth. And, and, uh, but any at any rate, God will get that work done also at this time. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. How you doing, Brother Campbell? Yes. I got one verse of Scripture I wish to explain. It's in John chapter 16, verses 13, about the Holy Spirit speaking. John 16, in which verse? 13. Verse 13. And I take my answer on the radio. All right. Thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, incidentally, in connection with our last caller, before I look at this answer, uh, Family Radio has prepared a, a, a number of books that assist us in searching the Bible for any information about this. One book is The End of the Church Age and After, Another book is Wheat and Tares, 
Wheat and Tares. And the third book is Time Has an End. And these three books, uh, along with others that uh, Family Radio has prepared in the past, are available free to anyone at all who calls for or writes for them. Uh, they are not uh, to be the authority. They are simply guides to get us into the Bible so that uh, ultimately the, the answers have to come from the Bible, not from a book that one of us has written. But, it, uh, but we can, uh, God has raised up teachers just to assist us in, in getting into the Word of God, and we have tried to be as faithful as possible in so doing. Now, we have a present question from John 16, verse 13, where, where Jesus is saying to his apostles before he went to the cross, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Now, Christ is speaking about the time that would begin at uh, a few weeks after Christ went back to heaven, when God began his plan to apply the word of God to the lives of a great many people all over the world uh, so that they would come to truth, uh, that is, they would become a child of God. Uh, that one, of course, that he's talking about is the Spirit of Truth, or the Holy Spirit, who is actually God himself. In other words, God would begin his plan of applying the Word of God to the lives of those that God intended to save. Uh, up until this time of John 16, basically the gospel was confined to the nation of Israel, and even in the nation of Israel, only a very tiny number actually did become saved. But it was God's plan that as soon as Christ went back to heaven, the light of the gospel would go out into all the world, and there would be people coming into the body of believers from every nation all over the world. And that's been going on to some degree, not in a great fashion, but in a, to some degree, all through the New Testament era of the church age. Uh, it, was, it has not been, from uh, what we, the kind of language we would use, a fabulous success story. Oh, it was successful in that it worked out precisely the way God intended it to work out. But insofar as seeing uh, church after church develop and, and being uh, just... Uh, uh, dripping with true believers who are just uh, desirous of only one thing, and that is being as faithful as possible to the whole Word of God. No, that did not develop, unfortunately. Uh, and God anticipated this, incidentally. But unfortunately, uh, 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 most churches uh, began to pick and choose from the Bible the verses they liked. Uh, they... Uh, really underscored the fact that these verses were infallible. They were from the word of voice of God. But then they put their spin on them. That is, they put their interpretation on what those verses mean. And uh, so in, uh, to a very high degree, they emptied the Bible of its truth. Uh, uh, actually, what the role of the teacher ought to be is not to change the meaning of what God has said, <clears throat> but to direct the individual to anything and everything else in the Bible that would help to him to understand what the meaning of that verse is. And unfortunately, that has not been done very well at all. But uh, uh, that, that is what God's plan was, that the Holy Spirit would open the eyes and ears of uh, people all over the world who would become saved and... Uh, and so, uh, by the time we came to the end of the church age, and 
Everything in the Bible points to the likelihood that was in the year 1988, just a few years ago, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, uh, the fact is that uh, the the Bible had been sent into all the world, and uh, there were a sprinkling of believers all over the world. But now we're in that final time, a final harvest that is completely outside of the local congregations. But now, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brock Campion? Yes. Brock Campion? Yes, go ahead. Yes, my name is Elia. I've been trying to get in touch with you. Thank you for taking my call. Anyway, the question I want to ask is that uh, you said that if you want to pray, we can go straight to God. But is it not the Bible said that uh, Jesus Christ is the is the man between man and God? Jesus Christ is eternal God. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Turn your radio off, please. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Or the Bible says of Jesus, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Or the Bible indicates that Christ is the creator of the world. And Genesis 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So Jesus uh, is without question eternal God himself. Thank you for asking your question. And uh, shall we go to our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. I have a passage uh, that I'd like for you to explain to me. Uh, it's John 2, John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. All right, John chapter 2, verse 13 to 17. There we read, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up uh, to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of the money sitting. And, oh, let's pause for just a moment and uh, take this uh, call. And then, well, let me, uh, maybe I can read one more verse. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money. We have a caller on the line who's asked about a couple of verses in John chapter 2. Very early on in Jesus' ministry, he went into the temple, and uh, there he found all those who were the money changers and the business that was going on as, uh, as uh, animals were sold that were going to be offered for sacrifice, and uh, all kinds of dickering and dealing was going on there. And Jesus overthrew all their temple, all their tables, and and drove out all these money changers. And he said in verse 16, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Now, uh, what is your question about this? Our, our, well, our caller wanted an explanation. I'm here. Yes. Uh, what, what does it mean by... Uh Take, uh, do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Well, you see, the fact is that that uh, the, our relationship with Christ is totally a spiritual relationship, and God's plan is freely you have received, freely give. Uh, Christ has provided an, at an enormous cost uh, a salvation for those that He planned to save. And uh, then we become his servants, and we are to freely uh, uh, be ambassadors of Christ to send that gospel into the world. But the tendency of man is uh, that uh, uh, money is the is the uh, driving force. And in fact, the Bible itself uh, itself says the love of money is a root of of all kinds of evil. And, uh, and money drives, it drives uh, this world to an exceedingly high degree. And so there's an enormous number of people who make the things of God 
the things that identify with the kingdom of God, like the Bible and the gospel and and the presentation of the gospel and all as a means by which they can make money. They merchandise the gospel. And, uh, and to do this, they abuse the doctrines. They set up their own private doctrines that are not altogether agreeable with the Word of God in order to sell more, that is, to be more acceptable uh, in what they are teaching. And, uh, and all of that is reprehensible to God. The fact is that the house of God ultimately is the kingdom of God, and it has nothing to do with with uh, trying to make money for ourselves, trying uh, to use that as the means by which to have a successful business and so on. And and uh, Christ is illustrating this by the... You see, these money changers uh, and this activity that was going on in the temple uh, at first blush looked like it was very holy activity because commands had been given by God to offer certain burnt sacrifices and blood sacrifices and and so the the money changers were there and the people who sold the doves and the lambs and so on were there in order to facilitate this and at first blush it looked innocent but Christ knew the hearts of these people and this was a business they were running they were simply in this business uh, to make money out of this, they had no interest in in uh, w- how this might relate to the gospel at all. Oh, uh, one more question: um, How does this passage in John tie in with the other three gospels? The same event happened in the other three. I know in John it happens early on in Christ's ministry, but in the other three, it happens near the end of his. Well, ministry. actually, Christ. Uh, uh, really uh, put quotations around it, the whole thing. He he started out with this, uh, clearing out the, the temple, and then just before he went to the cross, he went through this whole thing again. He drove them out. And this ties back incidentally to Jeremiah chapter 7, where, where we get a spiritual application of all this. Right, he says in verse 9 of Jeremiah 7, Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods? In other words, he, he's using these money changers and that business activity really as a picture of all those who use the, the Bible as an excuse or as a as a a means to get people's interest in their kind of a gospel which is actually a false gospel and so he's uh, because he goes on and come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say we are delivered and yet you do all these abominations is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. In other words, it is summarizing the the carnality of the <coughs> gospel of our day and uh, and uh, through much of the church age, and uh, as it already was in evidence in the days of, of Jesus, the, the the tremendous carnality of it. It was all for man's. Uh, own uh, benefit uh, that is uh, to enrich themselves it had nothing to do with with what with the reason God had given the gospel thank you very much thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum no yes good evening Mr. Camping yes <clears throat> yes I can hardly hear you you speak a little bit louder? Go ahead with your call. Yes. Uh, my question, uh, Mr. Campin, is where do you have the, do you get the idea or, uh, that, that God is against churches? I'd like to know because it's, it's, um, it's something that i never seen in, in, the, in the Bible, but well, the... and me and you must have seen it in the Bible. 
Yes. You see, yeah. you see it in the Bible? Well, you, you, you know. The, the, the idea that, that God is against the, the local churches. Well, uh, yes, God speaks about this in, in numerous ways. Uh, uh, for example, in the, uh, in the uh, book of Jeremiah, uh, God comes and uh, speaks. And, and the book of Jeremiah is really, really uh, speaking about our churches today. And uh, there he, uh, uh, um, there he uh, uh, indicates that, that uh, the pastors and the prophets and the priests have not been at all faithful as they have been bringing the gospel. They have been saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. They have been, uh, they have been saying a, a great number of things that, uh, for example, he says in Proverbs, in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 31, the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. And what will ye do in the end thereof? Now, that, uh, that kind of a statement is repeated and again and again uh, in different ways uh, 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 throughout the Bible as God is talking about our day, that it's a time when, when uh, God is, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, finally uh, telling us very plainly how he looks at what is going on in the churches and what he sees there he doesn't like at all. They have changed the gospel to suit themselves. They are not faithful to the gospel. They have a wrong method of understanding the gospel. They have a, a, a plan of salvation that's, that's man-made. It is not faithful to what God teaches and uh, so on. And so finally God is finished with the churches. We're talking about, you're talking about that time, in that time when the Old Testament was written. But, but it was talking about now? Well, but you see, the fact is that the uh, Bible gives us an abundant evidence that what is written in the Old Testament applies, uh, much of what applies, uh, what, many things that are, were written in the Old Testament apply to us today. It, it's not talking, uh, it's using ancient Israel as an illustration, but in actuality, uh, for example, if I go to Jeremiah 25, just to give you an idea uh, that indeed God is talking about today, he, there he is talking about uh, the Babylon coming against Judah, and uh, that literally did happen 2,500 years ago. But, but as God talks about this, uh, look at, listen to the language of what he says. And he's, he's saying in verse 26 of Jeremiah 25, And all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world, uh, which are upon the face of the earth, and the king of Shishak, that's Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, shall drink after them. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink, and be drunken, and vomit, and fall, and sin, no, and, and rise no more because of the sword which I will send against you. And so God is speaking about the end of the world here in Jeremiah 25 even though the immediate setting is what is happening there 2,500 years ago when uh, Israel is being uh, destroyed by, by Babylon. But uh, God used that as a picture of the end of the world. In actuality, he is writing in those chapters about our day. Okay. Well, can you cite another, another paragraph from the Bible that talks about it because I know you wrote a book about it I mean oh well there's a whole lot about that in the New Testament we go to Matthew 24 Matthew 15, 24 Matthew 24 I'm trying to write down so I look at it well yeah, 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 Matthew, Matthew what Matthew 24 verse 15 
when you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place and the holy place uh, that uh, that God uh, had set up was the New Testament congregations they were the local churches they were uh, where the Bible was to be but now the abomination of desolation that Satan is there then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and Judea there is a picture or a, a, a synonym for the kingdom of God and the only external representation of the kingdom of God in the New Testament era has been the local congregations now incidentally since you are very interested in this please please call or send for the book the end of the church age and after there, I, there. I, I mean how, look like you have a lot of material in order to to write a book because well, there is an enormous amount of material an enormous amount of material so please just uh, send for the book it you won't it won't cost you a penny it'll be sent to you postage paid just call for it and uh, and we gladly give it to you not in order to to uh, uh, get you to believe something but simply so that you can look into the bible and see uh, wh what the bible is saying about these kinds of things and you can make your own decision right because right. I do like to attend church. It's, it's for me, being a, a widow and being alone, it is a consolation to go and, and fellowship with other people and, of course, to praise God. Yeah, but see, the and problem I, is, the problem is that why do people want to, don't want to leave a church? They have put their trust in their church. Uh, their pastor has told them, uh, you have uh, uh, prayed the sinner's prayer, or you have been baptized in water, or you made a beautiful confession of faith. Therefore, I know that you are a true believer, and uh, we are a church of true believers. So you put your trust in that, and you feel that all is safe. But the no, fact I don't is... The, uh, the, the trust in the people or the, or the building of the church, I... I I put it, I trust in God. Well, I know, but if you trust in God, then you have to read the whole Bible. And then you have to check out what your pastor is teaching, what your church teaches, to make sure it is faithful to the whole Bible. And if you really begin to do that carefully, you'll find that there's many things they teach that are not true to the Word of God. I can assure you. Why is it that you have Baptists uh, who believe something different than Methodists, and Methodists believe something different from the Lutherans, and the Lutherans believe something different from the Roman Catholics, and the Roman Catholics from the Presbyterians? Why? If they all use the same Bible, you would think they would all have the same truth, but they all have different conclusions all claiming it came from the Bible. So it's very obvious that, that uh, uh, most of them do not have the truth, and maybe none of them have the truth. Because if you have the truth, Self then, have, um, then, then it, uh, if You have yourself said that it's very difficult to understand the Bible. Well, I know, but that's why we keep studying the Bible and we don't give up. We don't just say, well, it's difficult, so I'm just going to trust what, what we believe in our denomination. So I guess, I guess that's the reason many people interpret the Bible in different ways. Well, that's the problem, you see. In other words, they are simply trusting that what their pastor or their Bible teacher is teaching them is true, and and they have not them they have never learned themselves how to go into the Bible, and and how to really check this out and and that's why we have a program like the Open Forum where anybody can call in, and together we'll look at a verse and see once just what can we learn from that verse. And yes, uh, uh, Mr. Camping. Sometimes even the Bible contradicts itself. I have seen one paragraph and another one and compare and it's contradicting 
But you so, see, that that's because God wrote it that way, so that actually the Bible does not contradict itself. It simply tells us, uh, because I think there is a contradiction here, it means I don't understand yet what God is teaching me. Because when we finally come to truth, we find there are no contradictions in the Bible. Everything will fit into place. But that takes a lot of studying and a lot of homework. And this, uh, this is what, uh, one of the reasons we keep studying the Bible here in Family Radio. But right. thank you for calling and sharing. Thank you very much. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Harold. Yes. Um, say my question is, <laughs> there are so many wonderful women in the world, um, you know, believers, unbelievers, all different kinds. How are you possibly supposed to know who you're supposed to marry? Who are you supposed to marry? Well, first of all, God gives rules about that. The first rule is you can't marry someone who has uh, been divorced and have uh, their former spouse is still living. That would be contrary to the law of God. Uh, secondly, you don't want to, if you tr believe you are a true believer, you absolutely don't want to marry an unbeliever. So that, uh, that immediately li limits uh, who you're going to marry. And thirdly, it takes two to get married. You can't just decide, well, I see that person over there and I think I'll marry her, uh, she may not even want to look at you. And uh, in other words, it, it, it takes two to come to agreement on this. So by the time you uh, meet all of those requirements, you'll find that it is, and, and bear in mind that marriage is uh, uh, for, uh, till death doth, uh, doth us part, or until Christ returns, uh, the uh, that means that uh, uh, I, uh, when I marry, that is the most binding contract that we can ever have on this earth. There's no contract as binding as that of the marriage contract when we decide, when we agree to uh, marry someone. And uh, so that means you're going to use an enormous amount of caution and care uh, because you don't want to get yourself bound up with someone who later on you wonder, how in the world did I ever get into this this marriage? <laughs> but thank, well, thank you. Thank, thank you for that. calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Could you explain Matthew 19, verse 12? Matthew 19, verse 12. Let's look at that. Matthew 19, verse 12. There we read, uh, For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, there were some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of man, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Now, a eunuch is someone who uh, has no interest at all in the sexual relationship. Uh, and it was an, uh, not uncommon at all when a country uh, uh, conquered another country and there were certain uh, individuals that the conquering country wanted to use in their own government they would uh, they would uh, bring those young men in and and castrate them uh, that is make eunuchs of them so they would uh, not be interested in romance of any kind and would be more faithful in serving the country that they got into and uh, and on the and so God is using that as an illustration and there are some people who are born that way they they just are born without any uh, the necessary physical equipment so that they could engage in sexual relationship. And uh, uh, so, uh, but on the other hand, there are those who want to dedicate their life to the service of the Lord, and rather than become uh, involved in a romantic relationship with a fellow human, 
they 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 have committed themselves no i'm going to only live for christ and that's that they are they can do that there's no there's no uh, law against that although there's no law either that says that someone else can tell them they have to do that but thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum mr campy yes uh thank you for taking my call i called last month and asked you a question about uh, second kings chapter 25 and asked you to read several verses at the end of the chapter about the remnant that went to egypt after they were being threatened by a, another babylonian uh, king uh and they fled small and great to egypt have you ever heard of the stone of destiny no i've never heard of that well uh, this is jacob's stone uh, that he slept on and the angels descended and now, where uh, do you they read were this? supposed to have taken this stone to what? excuse uh, me from uh, from there uh, from jerusalem to uh, to egypt and now, the where, princesses yeah. were not taken to babylon excuse the, me uh, excuse me where where do you read this in the bible about the stone of destiny dies. i'm sorry and then the word was supposed to have spread uh, throughout um, baruch went with jeremiah and several others to the british isles and the well excuse me spread. excuse me w could you please uh, tell me uh, where in the bible does it talk about this stone of destiny ask a question but uh i don't really want to answer ask a question i really would like to make a comment a well short excuse comment. me but you're talking about something that isn't in the bible at all Hello? It, is, it is there's nothing in the bible about a stone of destiny well any... jacob's uh, jacob's stone the st that... uh, if you'll just please excuse me just let me explain uh i i believe I listen to you quite often, and I believe what you say about the end of the church age, and I have no doubts about what you're saying, and I believe that you're a prophet of the uh, late latter years, and uh, like uh, John the Baptist or uh, Jeremiah or an Isaiah, I really feel that you're called. A, but I see a lot of uh, uh, I see a lot of uh, con confusion uh, with uh, people who do not believe you and others that I will not name over the radio that are prominent uh, pastors, or so-called prominent pastors throughout the United States, and no one seems to agree with one another. And I, th I think that what happened in Korea back in the 50s when the pastors finally got together all from all different denominations, they had a great revival, and millions of people became saved, and they have the largest church in the world. I think that's what the United States needs is for people like yourself and other prominent pastors to get together and repent of all these differences and uh, repent and toward God and maybe we'll have revival in this country well but it, God uh, bless it, you. excuse me now I know that would be a, uh, the aspiration of a number of people perhaps but the but you have to remember uh, the salvation program is God's program not man's program and we can we can decide that if we did this or we did that, then this would happen or that would happen. But we we that isn't the way God works. He we have to go into the Bible, and God has laid out what His program is. And uh, His program isn't that there's going to be great revival because all the pastors get together. It's not going to be that way at all. Uh, that that doesn't fit in in any sense into the language of the bible it's just the opposite the, or the pastors they are uh, god has written uh, negative things about the pastors and the bible teachers of our day and anything that is connected with the churches is it's the, the holy spirit is not there and they can they can hold a huge meeting of some kind uh, and but that doesn't mean that there's going to be a, a lot of people getting saved now if we, it depends on what, how we define salvation. Sure, if we're going to uh, call salvation those who uh, um, uh, who uh, 
to make a claim that Jesus now is their Savior, yeah, that can all be done, but that's all man-made. Actually, God is the one who does the saving. And God is not saving in that method at all. He is saving uh, just through individuals as we send out the gospel into the world. And God knows how he's doing the saving. And it's not going to happen by pastors coming together. And uh, one of the problems, of course, with uh, when you when you uh, try to talk about uh, including Family Radio or myself in into a group of pastors who we all start out with an entirely different attitude toward the Bible, a different method of interpretation, a different understanding of actually what the Bible really is and what it's teaching. And uh, there's no possibility that there will be harmony, become harmony between us. Uh, that's, the Bible doesn't indicate that is possible. But now we have to pause for a message and then we'll go to our next caller. We're continuing with the Open Forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening. Welcome hello? to Open Forum. Yes. Yes, hello? Yes, go ahead with your call. Hello? Hello? Good, yes, good evening. Um, yes, I'm calling in reference to um, 1 Samuel 19. Um, uh, verses 20 through 24. 1 Samuel 19, verse 20. Let's look at that. 1 Samuel 19, verse 20. We read, uh, And Saul sent messengers. Now, uh, actually, uh, 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 David is uh, fleeing from Saul because... Uh, uh, Saul uh, is envious of David, and David has been anointed by God as the next king, and he's afraid that David might try to throw over his kingdom, which David never intended to do. And so now he's trying to have David killed. And Saul sent messengers to take David, and when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And it wasn't, when it was told Saul, he went sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. Then he went he also to Ramah, and to, came to a great well that is in Siku, and he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they be at Naoth in Ramah. And he went thither to Naoth in Ramah. And the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. And he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore they say, Is Saul also among the prophets? Now, what is your question? This is a very, very strange account, isn't it? Because Saul is very wicked. His, uh, the men that he, they are sending to take David are wicked. And yet God is showing without any question, but God is in charge. And these men, including Saul... They are acting like they uh, have a message from God there to prophesy means to declare the word of God. And, and they are saying things uh, that God is giving them to say, and they're acting like they have become true prophets. And, and uh, in fact, uh, they not only are saying, but they're acting. Saul strips off his little clothes and lays naked before God uh, uh, and before the people. Uh, showing that God has complete authority and power over these wicked men. And uh, that gives us an enormous assurance that we never have to fear of our fellow man. Uh, God is ours. He, he will uh, give us whatever protection he wants to give to us, and that's all that is necessary. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing 
And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, hello. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Uh, I've got a quick question regarding uh, if, for example, NASA aircraft, if they sent two uh, robots or uh, space objects to a universe, and uh, they are destined or programmed one to go into uh, uh, fall into an ocean and the other one safely return back home. Is that that's the way it's been programmed? All the human beings uh, from a now, where God's is, perspective. Where, excuse me, where is this program going on? Uh, is that pre-programmed inside the uh, human uh, nature, like how God has predestined or pre-programmed a person? Yeah, no, no, I'm, what is your question now? The question is, has God already pre-programmed a person, like he has to talk at so-and-so time, he has to behave like this, and is that that's the way he's being programmed? I, I'm somehow I'm not following you. I'm not. I somehow I can't uh, put it all together. Are you talking about some one who is doing a program like that? No. Uh, my question is: Has already God programmed a person to live so so and so, and the number of hairs he has even numbered, or uh, the number of hairs, and even a single hair falls down, he has a time time span that has been defined. Okay, at this particular time period, or at this particular time, and this number of the hair should fall down. And has he already programmed in such a way that a person has to be born and so and so date, has to die and so and so date, and there is no free will whatsoever of a person? Are you really asking, I think, about God's program for each individual? Does he have it all worked out for that individual? Uh, that he has to be born at a certain time and die at a certain time and so on. Uh, actually, uh, we don't know how God does this. He knows the end from the beginning. I often have thought about this, and this might relate to your question. Uh, 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 any one of us were born of two parents, of course, a mother and a father and uh, we carry the genes of our mother and father. They, in turn, were uh, born of parents uh, and their grand who are our grandparents, and our grandparents were born of certain uh, individuals who are our great-grandparents, and, and each of these have had to come into line in order that uh, that I am who I am, or each, uh, who, uh, how any one of us is who we are. Now, did God orchestrate it that that uh, our grandparent, my grandparents, uh, so and so, uh, uh, would get married, and so that uh, they in turn would bear a, a child, who in turn would marry uh, someone else who uh, was to be a a, a grand in the bloodline of my life and so on to come all the way down to where I am? Did God uh, institute all this or did God know how it was all going to develop and, uh, and uh, uh, simply uh, because he knows the end from the beginning? We don't understand. We don't know how all of that worked out. Maybe it's a combination. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, at times God nudges an individual to move in a certain direction in order to accomplish what God wants to accomplish. Now, all of that is, is beyond our understanding. Uh, but we do know this, that when God looked down the quarters of time and he saw John Doe, or, or any individual, who, whatever their name may be, out of the uh, almost seven billion people that live on the world today, he knew exactly all about that individual already more than 13,000 years ago. And, uh, and that's because God is God. God. God is an infinite being. And, uh, and uh, how he knows that, we don't know. And how he 
uh, has uh, guided the affairs of the world to bring that individual to, to the place where that individual is today with his parents and brothers and sisters and, and all the other things that go along. We don't know. That's all in God's business. But nothing is accidental and nothing is out of the purview of God at all. Now, thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Hello. Yeah, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, when the dog, when the animal dies and all, did they go to heaven or where did they supposed to go? Because somebody said that they don't go to heaven and they got souls just like we do. You see, an animal is a body with the breath of life. And when the breath of life is removed from that animal, uh, that animal is, is ended. That animal will never, never exist again. A human being is an entirely different kind of creation. We do have a body like an animal has a body. We do have the breath of life, just like an animal has the breath of life. But we also have an, a soul or a spirit essence because we were created in the image of God. And because we have a soul or spirit essence, therefore, when we die, it is not the end. We have to answer to God for how we lived out our life and and uh, we are going to spend eternity future either in the bliss and the happiness of of, ha of with Christ in, in in heaven because we have received a, a our salvation or we're going to spend eternity under the wrath of God making payment for our sins our death is entirely different than that of an animal, even though on the surface it looks identical. The animal dies and is buried. A man or a woman dies and is buried. But what we see with our eye is not what is. When the animal dies, yes, we, that's, we saw the end, and that's the end of the animal. But when the man dies, we know that on the last day that person's going to be resurrected again, either to go to be with Christ in heaven or to end up under, on the judgment throne, uh, before the judgment throne and be found guilty and be cast into hell. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so for that reason, you know, uh, we are very apprehensive of death we uh, because intuitively every human being knows that there is an eternity in front of them even though they don't want to uh, they can subjugate it and uh, so much in their thinking that that they don't they claim they don't know anything about it but deep in their hearts they know every human being knows there's something uh, uh, beyond the grave altogether, and uh, and therefore death normally is very fearsome. Even though again, people try to make it a time of delight. They even play games or or, or uh, try to uh, engage in frivolity of some kind, uh, trying to pretend like it isn't the disaster that it really is. But it really is an enormous uh, disaster because the next thing that person will know unless they become a child of God uh, in their life uh, they will they'll be standing before the judgment throne now because our animals are uh, and particularly in our day where people have uh, have uh, animals dogs and cats and canaries and uh, and uh, cockatoos and what have you that become very attached to they become very attached to and uh, then when that, uh, that animal dies or that bird dies, we feel terrible. We feel terrible. Oh, my, my. Just like we feel terrible when a human dies. But the fact is, when that, when that animal dies, there's no more pain 
Uh, and if that animal has been ill, if it has been suffering, death can be the kindest and most wonderful thing that could happen to that animal. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Kevin. How are you this evening? Yeah. Good, good. My question is regarding um, the proper Bible study. What, is, what must one do? And what, uh, there's a number of tools we, we have today, there's the concordances and Greek and Hebrew concordances. How, do, how does one go to properly look at a word in the Bible and know how many times it's translated? How do we know which one? Of course, God defines the Bible totally. Yeah. How does one know? Um, I've heard you in the past say that a concordance, we don't want to rely too much on that because that's a man's definition, which is true. How does one really know what God, how God, when we come to a concordance, what, how do we choose, or not that we choose, I'm sorry, but how, yes. does, how do we properly use well, concordances? And um, I have two questions, but that's the first question. I'll, well, I'll, that's a very good question. First of all, uh, the it, a proper Bible study be, begins with attitude. What is the Bible? We must have an attitude that the Bible is God's Word, and we are never, never to tamper with the original uh, Hebrew word or the original Greek word uh, that, uh, that, uh, from which we get our English Bible. We may never entertain the idea, maybe uh, we, this Hebrew word has been changed in some way. Although, when we read uh, uh, commentaries, uh, uh, by so po supposedly learned theologians uh, in, uh, again and again they will uh, struggle with a verse and they'll say you know maybe there was a problem with the original language or something in this and, and that is an attitude we may never have secondly a, common, a concordance is an exceedingly valuable tool it is a uh, it, it, uh, it is valuable not in the comments of the concordance where they, for example, uh, uh, take a word and they say this word means the, this and this and this. But when we, the value of the concordance is that it will show where that particular Hebrew word in the Old Testament is found everywhere else in the Old Testament. Or that particular Greek word uh, in the New Testament is found everywhere else in the New Testament. And uh, so then what you begin to do, and it's a long, hard process, and it, and it has to be in the setting of much prayer because uh, the Bible is a living word and, and, and we want God uh, to open our spiritual eyes to the truth, but we look up that word. Now, the reason we need a concordance to help, or because, of, let me say it the other way, the reason the concordance is so very helpful, here is a Hebrew word, for example, and we'll find in looking at the concordance that it has been translated by five different English words. Uh, and uh, when we read these five places, these uh, five English words, in our English Bible, we had no idea. They were all the same Hebrew word. Uh, and uh, 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 therefore, uh, they, they, this is the word that God had chosen. So we first of all have to find where all of these words are. And that is where the concordance helps. And that doesn't take any comments from the writer of the concordance. That's just a uh, looking at the Bible, uh, finding those words and showing us where those words are. Then you look at those texts, those verses where those other words are uh, found. Uh, uh, that is the same word that we are studying in the verse that we're studying right now, and see how they're used there, and uh, and you can begin to get an idea of maybe uh, how God is using it in the verse that you're looking at. All right, now that's one word. But a verse may have uh, five or six or eight key words. And so you have to look up each one 
and gradually you assemble this information in your mind and 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 of course the wonderful thing is that every time you look up another verse which has one of these same words in it you again are reading the Bible and so you're always learning you're always in the setting of hearing God speak to you so it's while it is laborious very laborious and uh, slow going at the same time you're learning all the time a little bit here a little bit there and you're picking up other information you never even thought you uh, you uh, were looking you were looking for it and and uh, and this all develops as you go along but uh, and then after you get all done you've looked up every word in that verse that uh, you feel is a key word and you've uh, found every other place where these words are used and maybe then you uh, have now a fuller understanding of what that verse is saying or maybe you don't have you know God it keeps us very humble and I've worked with verses sometimes for a long long time and when I got all through with it I have to say I still don't understand oh Lord you'll have to teach me at another time and maybe six months later I'll be reading something else in the Bible that uh, that uh, apparently uh, uh, does not relate at all, and then the light will dawn. Oh, wait a minute! That that ties back to that verse I was struggling with six months ago. Let me see. Yeah, that helps a whole lot. Now I I, I can get a little better understanding of that verse, and that's what Bible study is. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, hi, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, could we look at uh, the book of Romans, uh, chapter 10 and verse 13? Romans 10, verse 13. Let's look at that. Romans 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right. I urge you and all of your listeners to really pray with all of your heart, Lord Jesus, please save me. Because if you call upon the name of the Lord with all of your heart, and we do have the free will to do that because God gave it to us, then we are being faithful in reaching out to Christ and receiving the free gift that he offers us. And if we're willing to do that, he will be faithful to save us. And if we're not willing to do that, it means we are not willing to submit ourselves to his design for salvation. Well, the problem is that uh, yeah, what you have just said, of course, agrees perfectly with the man-made gospel, that the do-it-yourself gospel that all the churches teach. But the problem is you have not factored in a whole lot of other information in the Bible. The Bible says that we're dead. We're spiritually dead. The Bible says that, uh, that we're like a valley of dry bones. The Bible uses the figure of a, of a stinking corpse. And how in the world can a dead corpse call upon God? And so right at the outset, you're stopped cold in your tracks. Well, okay, it is true. If we would call upon him, we will be saved. But how, what, what has to happen so that we'll call on him if we're, if we're, if we're spiritually dead bones? It means, first of all, God has to save us. And when God saves us, when he opens our spiritual eyes, when he gives us a new heart, a new life, uh, I, I, and God insists that he will do that uh, for those that he plans to save, and again, we don't even know whether we're one of uh, God's elect because God didn't choose everybody to become saved. In other words, this, this conclusion you've come to fits perfectly with your do-it-yourself gospel, but it's not the gospel of the Bible. It doesn't take into account predestination or God's election program, the fact that we're dead, the fact that Jesus said, no man can come to me except God, uh, no man can come to the Father except uh, God draw him, and so on. It, it, it is simply built upon uh, uh, some ideas that man likes very much, but it will not wash with the whole Bible. 
Mr. Camping, you, 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 seem, you seem to be saying that uh, people have free will in every single area of life except the, the most important one. That is to say, it sounds like you're saying we have free will to choose our, our life partner, our spouse, uh, free will to choose our vocation, our career, and, and all of the important things in life, whether we have children or not, and, and on and on and on. And yet the most important thing in life, which is our relationship with Christ, whether we're going to spend eternity in heaven, is the one thing that you're saying we don't have free will in, and we have free will in everything else. Well, that's now, because, you say, and, and you're correct, of course, because physically we're alive. When, when the Bible says we're like a valley of dry bones, he's not talking about us being a physically a, a valley of dry bones. We're not physically a stinking corpse, but we are spiritually a valley of dry bones. And uh, we're spiritually a stinking corpse. We're spiritually dead. And that is why God has to, uh, has to do the, w the whole work of saving us. And, and uh, the, the, when God talks about election, for example, that he chose those that he planned to save from before the foundation of the world and predestinated them to salvation, as we read in Ephesians chapter 1, right from the mouth of God, He's not talking about our physical life. He didn't choose us to, uh, to live physically. He's talking there about our spiritual life. And so, of course, there's a vast distinction between the two. And, you know, this is exactly the nature of a do-it-yourself gospel. We decide we have free will uh, to choose. Well, that's, that's our decision. We like that very much. It doesn't, the Bible doesn't teach that, but we like it, and it fits into our particular scheme that we've worked out. It also, in, it, holds the, it also is based on the idea that Christ somehow, in some generic way, paid for the sins of everybody, and it doesn't take into account at all the enormous cost and uniqueness of, of uh, God's salvation plan for each and every individual that he planned to save and and so on it's it's strictly a man-made gospel where certain verses are picked out and put together and all the others are left out and and the minute we begin because what are you going to do when uh, when uh, you read Romans 3 that there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. You've got to factor that into your statement. And so you see, uh, the minute you have a man-made, and this is the whole problem, the gospel that is in, available to the world today by the churches and congregations is a man-made Gospel that seems to make a lot of sense. People love it. They like it. Uh, millions believe they have become saved, but it will not stand the tough scrutiny of the whole Bible. And unless we have a doctrine that will stand the scrutiny of the whole Bible, we do not have truth. And that's just the way it is. But right now, We've come to the end of our time. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.